People, welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to another video. If you're stopping by the channel for the first time, please consider subscribing to my channel. And while you're at it, smash that like button for me. I really would appreciate it. Also, hit that post notification bell so that you're notified every time I upload a new video. Be careful down in the comment section of the videos. A lot of spam, a lot of scammers. I will never ask you to contact me by WhatsApp or Telegram. I also do not invest money for my subscribers, so please be careful. Don't get yourself scammed. If you want to follow me on Instagram, you can follow me at Richard Fane Millionaire Mentor. That link for my Instagram is down in the description box of the video. Make sure you click on that link down in the description box of the video for my Instagram. There's a lot of scammers on Instagram pretending to be me, so please be careful if you decide to follow me on Instagram, which I think you should because I post some pretty good stuff on Instagram, 60 second reels, talking about financial freedom, and some other stuff. You know, every now and then I might wanna get in the dancing mood and get on my patio and cut a rug. I put that on Instagram as well, just to kind of lighten things up and let y'all see a little bit more of my personality. So if you want to rock with me on Instagram, go down to the description box of this video, click on my Instagram link, Richard Fane Millionaire Mentor. Follow me on Instagram, I'm trying to get my Instagram presence built back up again. Some of you have been rocking with me for some time. Y'all will know I used to have the Richard Fane 28 Instagram page, which had, which had over 90,000 followers. Instagram shut that account down because I believe too many impersonating scammers. So they shut that page down. So I had to create this new one, which I've had for a few months. And it's Richard Fame Millionaire Mentor. So if you guys want to rock with me on Instagram, go follow me. Go down to the description box. Click on that Instagram link and it'll take you directly to Richard Fame Millionaire Mentor. Once again, just be careful. A lot of impersonating scammers on Instagram. So please be careful. Remember, I will never ask you to send me money. I will never, never, never ask you to send me money to invest for you. Never. I don't have no investment programs and, you know, Forex programs or, you know, crypto trading program. None of that. Those are all scammers. So please be careful if you do decide to follow me on Instagram. If you want up to 15 free stocks, Moomoo is going to give you up to 15 free stocks. When you open a new Moomoo brokerage account, they're going to give you up to 15 free stocks for just trying out their brokerage app. It's a self-directed brokerage app. You don't send me no money, right? It's a self-directed brokerage app where you can buy paper assets to build your wealth. That's the brokerage app that I use to make my trades when I buy my paper assets. So if you want to rock with me, go down to the description box, click on that Moomoo link. When you put $100 in your new brokerage account, they're gonna give you five free stocks. When you put $1,000 in your new brokerage account, they're gonna give you 15 free stocks. Now guys, this is a limited time offer. Don't delay, get started today or you may miss it. It's a limited time offer, right? Moomoo, periodically will change up their, their offerings for these, this free stock. So for right now, you get up to 15 free stocks. Next month, it might be something different. So if you wanna take advantage of the 15, up to 15 free stocks, go down to the description box, click on that Moomoo link, open up your new Moomoo account today, go get that free stock, go get that free money. I'm gonna also send you two videos once you open that Moomoo account. The first video is going to be what I call the Wealth Transfer Blueprint. That's a video I did walking you guys through 
the three big boy paper assets that I am buying in 2024 and beyond to build my net worth, to double my net worth. It'll give you the three paper assets that I'm buying that video. And again, all you got to do is email me and let me know. I opened the Moomoo account, Richard. I funded it, and I'm going to send you that video. I'm going to also send you the Moomoo tutorial video. This is a video I did to help people that are brand new who are not familiar with using brokerage apps, self-directed brokerage apps, specifically Moomoo. I walk you through how to use that app, the basic information, so that you can navigate it and start building wealth through buying paper assets. Those two videos I'm gonna send to you when you send me an email, and my email address is down in the description box. Everything for me, guys, just an FYI, everything for me is down in the description box of my videos. All of my contact information. If you don't get it from the description box of the videos, be careful. You may be contacting somebody else. Every way to contact me is in the description box of these videos here on YouTube. That's it. That's the only way to contact me. So somebody else, I had a subscriber send me an email yesterday and said, Richard, is this your phone number? Is it in the description box of my videos? Oh, no, it's not. Well, then it ain't my phone number. Matter of fact, I don't put my phone number in the description box of the videos. Only thing that's in there is my email address and all my social media links. And then, of course... Moo Moo and, and my Weeble links. That's the only thing that's in my description box, right? So if you want to rock with that, guys, go down to the description box. Number one thing to rock with is that Moo Moo offer. Number two thing to rock with is that email address so that you can email me so I can send you those two videos to get you to your point where you can start building some wealth. Well, guys, we got a lot to cover today. First of all, thank you so much for, for popping in checking in no matter how long you're in the chat i appreciate you guys rocking with me every day as i talk about different financial aspects of our economy you know interest rates inflation what's going on with these big banks what's going on with this whole recession thing that we're going to talk about today and and, and more more importantly guys it's about helping you build wealth Everything I do on this channel, every live stream, every video I upload is all about helping you get to your financial freedom, right? Y'all know me. I, I'm not big in the comment section on these videos. I don't even respond. I look at them sometimes, but I don't respond. I may give a heart, but that's not my objective here is to argue with people in the comment sections. My job here is to give you information that you can take if you want to and use it to build your wealth. It's not to, to be the most popular YouTuber. It's not to be loved by everybody. My whole job here is to give you financial information that you can use to build your wealth. That's it. If you don't want that, then find another channel. It's pretty simple, right? Y'all know me. I'm direct. I'm straight to the point. I ain't gonna sugarcoat it. I don't want people watching my videos who are not here to build wealth. If you're not here to build wealth, don't watch them. Oh, you'll say the same. That's right. It's repetitive. I'm going to talk about the same topics every single day because that's how we get to wealth. I'm not going to talk about some uh, gossip crap between, you know, what P. Diddy did and what he didn't do. I'm, that ain't my thing. I'm, you ain't going to get that on this channel. The only thing you're going to get on this channel is how to build wealth, how to use paper assets to turn it into wealth how to use real estate for income to turn it into wealth, how to start businesses, grow businesses, turn it into wealth. What you should be doing with your money in the midst of a looming recession. Here's the things you should be doing with your money to protect yourself. That's it in this channel. If you don't like that, get out. If you don't like the repetitive nature of the channel, get out. Don't pop in. <laughs> it's pretty simple. Okay, let's move on. Like I said, we're going to talk about this recession thing because it's, it's starting to rear its ugly head again. This word recession is starting to rear its ugly head again, guys. And I know a lot of y'all are saying, well, golly, man, how can we have a recession when we're getting ready to see the Fed reduce interest rates, right? We see inflation coming down. How in the world can a recession happen? I'm going to tell you how. 
at least what some people think. I'm going to tell you exactly what they think. And then you can make the determination if you want to prepare for a recession or not. You don't want to pre prepare for one? Don't. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep doing what you're doing. You're going to keep getting the results you're getting. That's it. So if you don't want to prepare, you don't want to be smart with your money, don't. Right? Okay. Then we're going to talk about the housing market. Guys, it is so much more expensive to buy a house today than four years ago. You need more, you need 80% more money to buy a, to buy a house today than you, you did four, four years ago. And guess what? I'm going to tell you why. Just stick around. We're going to talk about that because I know a lot of you guys are interested in home ownership. This is a good information for you to think about in here. Then we're going to talk a little bit about stocks in, in, in the first quarter. We're going to talk about the first quarter of 2024, how stocks did, how the S&P did, how the Dow did, how the NASDAQ did. And guess what, guys? If you'd have been listening to me in January, January 1st, if you'd have been listening, when I was telling you to get into the market, when I was telling you to double down, You'd have been happy right now because we had a crazy first quarter of 2024. If you was on the rocket ship, boop, you'd have been, you'd have been going to the moon. But if you didn't get on the rocket ship and you were down here taking pictures of the rocket ship, you missed out. But good news is you got three more quarters. So stick around. We're going to talk about stocks a little bit. Then, of course, you know, I got to give you my daily dose of crypto. Uh, one of your one of your big boy blue chip Wall Street firms is saying Bitcoin returns likely to returns likely to come down. Saying Bitcoin is going to fall. This is one of your big boy blue chip Wall Street firms saying Bitcoin may take a tumble. We're going to talk about that too, and then we're going to finish finish up the chat. Well, thank you guys again for rocking with me. Like I said, but let's go ahead and dive into. Our first topic, which is the recession, because I know why most of you guys have popped in is for the recession. But if you're smart, you'll stick through the whole thing and get all of this information, dissect it, throw back what you need, keep what you, uh, uh, you need, throw back what you don't need, and then build wealth. Whole point is to build wealth. But let's start with this, this, this recession thing. Here's the headline. The Fed's rate cut proje projections are pointing to an imminent recession, says economists. Let's talk about it. Let's see exactly what these cats are talking about. The Federal Reserve's interest rate forecasts are flashing warning signs of a recession just around the corner. Top economist David Rosenberg says the Fed's the Fed doesn't want to say this explicitly, but it is actually saying in not so many words that a recession is very likely coming our way. See, y'all thought I was just click clickbaiting you. No, I ain't clickbaiting you. I'm telling you the truth. What could happen? You better prepare and have yourself ready for it, right? Here we go. Despite the Fed's optimistic forecast of 2.1% GDP growth and 4% unemployment. So what is GDP? That's gross domestic product, right? Now the Fed is saying, we forecast that the economy, the economy, our whole economy will grow by 2.1%. Will grow by 2.1%. What did it do last year? It grew by over 3% last year. So the Fed is coming in and with their predictions and saying it'll grow by 2.1%. And again, guys, the measuring stick is 2% for the GDP, right? That's the measuring stick. The measuring stick is for it to grow by 2%. We had a good year if we can grow by 2% or better, right? That's the measuring stick. The Fed is coming on record saying we predict 2.1, but we also predict unemployment to go up to 4%. That's what they're predicting. Right now, I believe it's 3. I think it's 3.9 currently. 
they're predicting it'll go up to 4.1%, right? Rosenberg sees officials' prediction of a sharp drop in the median federal funds rate as a recession indicator, right? The Fed anticipates the median federal funds rate will drop by 150 basis points to 3.875 by 2025 and 225 basis points to 3.125% by the end of 2026. Big drastic drops, guys, in the Fed funds rate because it's currently 5.5%. So they're thinking in 20, by 25, it'll be 3.875%. And by 26, it'll be down to 3.125%, which is, which is a lot. It gives us access to what? More capital. Why does that give us access to more capital? Because we can borrow money cheaply again. See, anytime we can borrow money cheaply, that introduces a new supply of money to our financial system. Right now, you don't have that supply of money from borrowing because the borrowing costs are too high. Doesn't make sense. You can't, you can't make it work. You don't have personal savings either. So that you can't introduce that money supply to our economy because you and I, the 99 percenters, we burnt through $2 trillion of our savings, our personal savings. So we don't have access to that money supply anymore, and we don't have access to borrowing money as a money supply. The only thing we have right now is our wages, and that's what they're going to, this, this, this information here is going to zero in on. Why that is a little bit dicey, right? We're going to zero in on that in a second here. And, and, and so, so, so th this is what this, this economist is saying. Rosenberg said in the past instances of a soft landing in the economy, the Fed typically reduces rates by 75 basis points, as seen in 1987, 1995, 1998, 2019. The only exception was September 1984 to August 1986, when rates saw deeper cuts following 60% collapse in oil prices. So basically what this guy is saying is, when he looks at history of rate cuts, typically the Fed does about 75 basis points. But when they do deeper rate cuts, 150 basis points, 225 basis points over a period of time, that normally signals they're trying to prevent a recession. Again, you got to understand how the money supply works in this country, right? Money supply, personal savings, borrowing money, jobs. Those are three money supply areas for our economy. Two of those money supplies have been cut off. We got one money supply left for the 99 percenters, which is jobs salaries, wages, right? And he's saying the Fed, they're concerned about a recession. That's the reason they're predicting deeper rate cuts. Why? Because when you drop rates, what do you do to the money supply? At least to one of the money supplies. You turn it back on. See, when you drop weights, now people have access to another money supply, which is borrowing, which we don't have access to today. But that's how you stimulate the economy. You stimulate the economy by dropping rates, guys. And the only reason the Fed would drop rates like that so rapidly, according to this economist, is if they believe there's a recession coming. That's why he's saying they're dropping rates as drastically as going to drop them over these next two years, because they believe inflation is, I mean, a, a, a recession is coming. Outside of that episode, any move down in the Fed funds rate during the post-World War II era, anywhere close to 150 basis points, the forecast by the end of 2025 only occurred because of one thing, recession. As the Fed has shifted focus to combating recession, 
Stock investors are eagerly anticipating a series of rate cuts starting this year. But so he's saying the reason they're going to be drastically dropping these rates over the next two years is because they're afraid of a recession. I think that's logical, guys. I ain't mad at him. I think that's logical thinking. Because I understand when rates drop, it introduces more money supply to our economy. When you drop rates, you're trying to stimulate something. And, and our economy will be stimulated because you're introducing a new money supply, which is borrowing. Right now, we don't have that money supply. And you got to follow what's happening in the jobs market, guys. The labor market is softening. I believe the, 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 the February labor report was already, um, it, it was corrected. And, and it was corrected downward, not upward for jobs. I think the report initially came out and y'all helped me out with this in the chat. I believe the report initially came out with 275,000 jobs being added to the economy in February. That number has been revised downward. It's been revised downward. So anybody in the chat got those numbers, put them up, but it's been revised downward. As the Fed has shifted focus to combating recession, stock investors are eagerly anticipating a series of rate cuts starting this year. I say be careful what you wish for. In recessions, interest rates, bond yields, and equity prices all go down in tandem, he said. The president of Rosenberg Research also warned investors about the perilous terrain of the leveraged loan market, especially as economic downturns loom larger. Defaults are now piling up as the delinquency rate has topped 6%. So in this high interest rate environment, guys, what happens? What happens? People start defaulting on loans. People start to defaulting on loans. And that's what this guy is saying. Defaults are now piling up as the delinquency rate has topped 6%, doubling the average since 1997, while fast approaching levels that touched off the 2001, 2008, 2020 recessions. So here's what he's saying also. As you see delinquencies go up, there's a correlation between high delinquencies and defaults and recessions. Direct correlations. And that's where he, he quoted here 2001 recession. 2008 recession, 2020 recession. When you saw those recessions come, you also saw high delinquencies prior to those recessions hitting. So you got to be careful here with what's happening with interest rates. Interest rates are going to be coming down. Why? You got to ask yourself, why would the Fed decrease these short-term interest rates? Well, maybe because the jobs market is softening and they think it's softening a little too soft and they know. See, you got to understand the Fed predicts unemployment to be 4.1% in 2024, but not CBO, which is the Congressional Budget Office. They're predicting 4.4% unemployment. So if you continue to see these labor reports or these job reports come in, it'll be interesting to see. Again, did anybody in the chat figure out what the revised February 2024 uh, jobs added to the economy was? Because I know the, the report came out. Let me see if I can find it real quick and then we'll, we'll continue on here. I, I know. the Let's see. February 2024. Jobs report revisions. Let's see if it was had any revisions. Yeah, 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 yeah. It looks like it did have some revisions. 
says U.S. jobs totaled 275 in February, but employment rose to 3.9. Um, what are estimates? Now, now, check this one out, though. Downward revisions to December and January reduced initial estimates by 167,000 jobs. So the report we got in December, the report we got in January 2024, those two reports combined were revised downward by 167,000. Somebody in the chat just gave me a number I was looking for. In fact, now 167 guys, 167,000 jobs, it was revised downward, those two reports. Then you look at the February report, looks like it was revised down to 228,000 jobs from 275,000. So you can see it's starting to soften. It's starting to soften, right? And you can see that even the Fed is predicting unemployment to go up to 4.1%. CBO is saying unemployment will go up to 4.4%. So this gentleman is saying, this economist is saying the Fed is being so aggressive. They're going to have they're going to be aggressive with rate drops over the next 2 years because they're trying to prevent a recession. They know we, at the 99 percenters, we don't have any personal savings. The 1% does, but we don't. And to make things worse, we don't have any assets. The majority of us don't have no assets either. We don't have no personal savings and we have no assets to turn to that generate income. We also don't have the ability to borrow money anymore. And those of us who have borrowed money we're in a situation where we're starting to be, be, make late payments. We're starting to go delinquent on our bills. 30% of Americans are delinquent on some type of loan payment. 30% of Americans right now are delinquent on some type of loan payment. So what this gentleman is saying is there may be a recession coming. May or may not be, right? May or may not be. What's the definition of a recession, right? Two quarters of what? Negative GDP. All you need is two quarters, technically, two quarters of negative growth in our economy constitutes a recession, guys. So if we get two quarters of negative growth in the economy, that's a recession. That's what the Fed don't want to happen. So that's why they're going to be dropping these interest rates. I keep telling, oh, they may, they may not drop this year. No, they drop it. They got no other choice. You either drop or we're going to go into negative territory when it comes to GDP. And once we go into negative territory, too late. It's too late. It's too late. And guess who they're going to blame? The Fed. And the Federal Reserve knows that. They're going to get the blame. Why? Why do they? They should get the blame. Why? Because they control interest rates. The Fed controls interest rates. They should get the blame. Yep, you took the job, Jay Powell. You took the job, rest of the Federal Reserve Committee. You took the job. You control interest rates. You have the ability to take interest rates up. You have the, the ability to take interest rates down. You control interest rates. Therefore, you control the recession, in my opinion. What should you be doing? Here's what I tell you should be doing with your money, guys. Number one, I always tell you guys to prepare for the worst, but expect the best. How do you prepare for a recession? You get multiple streams of income. That's how you prepare. You have multiple streams of income. That's how you prepare. Now, maybe it don't come, but if it does, again, we prepare for the worst, but we expect the best. Now, there may not be a recession, but guess what? I'm going to prepare like it may be one. And in a recession, what happens? People lose their jobs. That's what happens. They lose their jobs. And if you out there caught with your pants down, one primary source of income, no other way of making money, no emergency fund, no assets, what's going to happen to you financially? 
you're going to be devastated. So my recommendation to, to, to prepare yourself for a recession, if one comes, see me personally, I always prepare for the worst and always expect the best. I always am preparing for the worst, guys. I, I don't control any of this. What I can control is my preparation. I can control my preparation. I can't control if there's a recession. I can't control if the Fed bring interest rates up or down. I can't control what the stock market does. I can't control what the housing market does. I can't control how many jobs are added to the economy or how many are not added. I can't control any of that. But what I can control is preparation. See, I can control that. Yep. And I'm telling you now, prepare. Prepare for the worst. But expect the best. Get your multiple streams of income. That's what you should be doing right now, guys. You should be working on multiple streams of income. Every single day, you should allocate a set number of hours to developing side hustles. Everybody I talk to in my one-on-one -on -one sessions, I tell them the same thing. You should be sitting down and running your personal finances like it's your own business. You should be thinking like a business owner, not an employee right now. You should be thinking like a business owner. And guess who the business is? You. You're the business. I conduct myself every single day as a business owner. Even when I was working in banking for 25 years, guys, I never looked at myself as an employee. I looked at myself as a 1099 guy, even though I was a W-2 guy. I always looked at myself as a 1099 guy. I did. And I planned my day accordingly. See, a lot of us want to make excuses about, oh, I don't have no time in the day. Every, I'm so busy. No, you're not. No, you're not. No, you're not. Nobody works 24 hours a day. We want to make excuses because we're lazy. We're lazy. A lot of us are just flat out lazy. Let's be honest. Come on. I, I, I'm not picking. I'm just being honest. A lot of us are just flat out lazy. Let's just admit that. That's the first step to getting on the same page, right? A lot of us are just flat out lazy. Right? We just, we are. Now, here's the thing. We can be lazy and mentally think we're, we're tired and, oh God, I'm exhausted. Okay. If you choose that, choose it. I'm of the, I'm of the mind frame that I'd rather be a little bit tired, but I'm going to get these side hustles developed so I can protect myself and my family in the event something happens. In the event I get laid off from work. In the event I get sick. I mean, you, 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 you got to have multiple streams of income so that you can take that money, man, and invest it. Number one, you can take it and build up your emergency fund three to six months. See, the side hustle money, that's where you, that, that's where you can pay off your, all this debt you got. You're not going to pay all your debt off with your primary income, guys. You're not. How you pay debt off is through additional income you earn. Because you can take all of that additional income and rapidly pay that debt down. If I'm working eight hours a day, I get home. Let's say I got a, let's say I got a prototypical eight hour a day work schedule. Right? Prototypical. And I know some of y'all work longer hours. Maybe some of y'all work shorter hours. But, but prototypically, on average, let's say we work an eight hour day. Let's say I clock in at 9 a.m. And I clock out at 5 p.m. I've, that's my primary income. That's where I earn the bulk of my income. Boom. Those hours are put to the side. Now I get home. Let's say I get home at 5.30, 6 o'clock. Let's just say I get home at 6 o'clock. Monday through Friday, this is the routine. I get home at 6. I spend a little time with the family. Maybe we have dinner. Maybe I run the kids to, to, to practice. Whatever my responsibility as, a, as, a, as a, a family member, I do those responsibilities. And let's say by nine o'clock, I'm done. So from six to nine, family, eat, run the kids around, boom. 
Nine o'clock, I'm done. Nine to 11, those two hours, I need to be grinding. Every single night, Monday through Friday, I should take those two hours and I should be immersed into creating multiple streams of income. But I'm gonna tell you what most of us do. This is what most of us do. We'll do the job, we'll do the family thing, and then we think we deserve the rest of the night to just entertain ourselves, pleasure ourselves, right? Yeah, Netflix and chill. <laughs> See, we deserve it. I worked all day, but we did broke. A, a, a mountain of credit card debt. See, that's what most of us do. Where well, you should be taking that time and building outside hustles. When I was in the banking industry, man, I was doing this same schedule. Nine to five corporate thing. Home, taking care of the family. From, from, from eight o'clock to 11 o'clock, guys, I was on the internet buying watches on eBay, on other sites that sold. I was buying luxury watches. I was sourcing these watches three hours a night, Monday through Friday. That's what I did. And I did it for 15 years. But guess what it did for me though? It got me to the point where those three hours a night, as I got good at this thing, I was making over $100,000 a year just flipping watches. Yeah, and guess what I did with that money? I didn't spend it. I didn't go blow it on crazy stuff. Guess what I did with it? I took that money and I doubled down on real estate for income and I doubled down on the stock market. Because see, I knew when I got to 50 years old, I needed to be done. Forget that pleasure in myself. Forget Netflix. Forget any of that crap. But guess what I get to do now? Since I'm free. At 50 years old, I was free. Guess what I get to do now for the rest of my life? Whatever I want to do. So if I want to Netflix and chill, guess what? I can Netflix and chill and guess what? Money's still rolling in. You see what I'm saying? I don't go, I don't have to give nine hours, eight hours, 10 hours to some corporate job anymore. Why? Because I, I, I gave up something in the beginning to get everything I wanted in the end. And a lot of us just don't want to do that. If this recession comes, guys, and you're not prepared, you're going to get ran over. You ever seen that uh, cartoon when we were growing up as kids, The Road Runner? And he was, he was chasing uh, the, the rabbit. What's the rabbit name? Uh, whatever the little rabbit name. You know how that, 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 that coyote used to get, get ran over? I'm telling you, guys, that's, that's how you're going to be. You're going to get ran over by this this. this you're going to get ran over by this recession if it happens. Oh, it won't happen. Guys, it, it, it happened in 2001, happened in 2008, happened in 2020. It can happen at any time. You only need two quarters of, of negative GDP growth. See, a lot of us don't understand what a recession is. We think it's a collapse in the whole world. No, it's not. It's two sessions, two quarters of negative growth in our economy. That's what it is. That could happen. That could happen. Now the Fed, like I said, I don't believe the Fed will allow that to happen because I think they're gonna reduce rates. But, but here's the thing they gotta watch. They gotta watch the labor market because that's, that's where the rubber meets the road. Remember, I've already told you, we don't have money supply from borrowing money. We don't have money supply from personal savings. All we have, the 99 percenters, is our job. If that unemployment rate goes up to 4.5%, 5%, if the labor market continues to soften and we don't have these two things, now we don't have either, we don't have, we don't even have labor anymore. We don't even have wages anymore. That's where the trouble comes in. So the Fed has to reduce rates so that they can introduce a new, this money supply from borrowing money again. Because now you and I can go out and borrow money again. We can get that equity credit line. We can go get this, 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 this whatever loan we need to, 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 to tie, help tide us over and, and it not break the bank. We can refinance some high interest rate loans right now that are crushing us. Some of us got car loans where we got 8, 9, 10, 12, 14% rates. 
They bring down short-term interest rates. Some of you guys will be able to refinance those loans and get smaller monthly payments, which will help your budgeting, which will help you be able to stay afloat. That's why it's critical that they reduce rates. Some of y'all have these high interest rate loans right now that are crushing you, specifically car loans. A lot of y'all went out in 2021, 2022, 2023, and, and some of your back was against the wall and you had to do what you had to do. I get that. But with rates coming down, you can potentially refinance that loan to a lower rate, which would reduce your loan payment. So that's how money supply, that's how being able to borrow money introduces another money supply into our economy because you have the ability now to go out and refinance these high interest rates loans. You have the ability to go out and get new loans at a cheap interest rate that you can then put back into the economy. That's why the Fed is gonna reduce rates and that's why they have to reduce them to fight a recession. So I, I, I agree with this guy 100%. You may disagree and I'm sure a lot of people will. I agree with the guy though. The Fed has no other choice because if they don't, they're going to break something. And if, they, and if this labor market breaks, because that's the only thing saving us. Let's not get it twisted. The only thing saving us in this country right now for the 99% is the labor market. That's the only thing saving us, guys, is your job, your wages. That goes away, it's going to be chaos in the streets. I'm just telling you. And the Fed know that. So they got to reduce these rates. Now let's go ahead and move on and let's talk about this the housing market real quick, because again, I know a lot of you guys are, are wanting home ownership, right? But, but you gotta understand what's happening here and, 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 and how things have gotten so expensive. Here's the thing, everything's getting more expensive, but guess what your salary has done? It's gotten smaller, it's gotten smaller. It hasn't outpaced your, your goods and services. Your salary has not grown as fast as everything that you got to pay for with that salary is what I'm saying. So here's the headline. Home buyers need to earn 80% more than they did in 2020 to afford a home in today's market. How do you like them numbers? You have to earn 80% more than you earned in 2020, four years ago. Four years ago, guys, in today's home buyer market, you have to earn 80% more than you earned in 2020. How many of y'all got an 80% raise over the last four years? Anybody in the chat got an 80% raise over the last four years? Anybody in the chat got more than an 80% raise in the last four years? But yet and still, that's what you're going to need if you're going to buy a home in today's market. Let's read on. Let's read on. Let's read on. Home prices are up 42% since 2020. But because both rates and borrowing costs have skyrocketed, you need to earn 80% more to comfortably afford a home in today's market. Guys, I don't know what world you living in, but the world I live in, I don't know nobody got an 80% raise. Not in the world I live in, especially not if you're a W-2 person. Now, if you're a business owner, you might have did it. But if you W-2, no, nah, no, nah, you didn't do it. Not, not, not the 99%, not a 1% might have did it. Not 99%. Median incomes have risen just 23% over the past four years. <laughs> 23%, guys. The problem is everything you got to buy has risen higher than 23%. You do understand that, right? That's why I keep telling y'all, prepare for the worst. Expect the best. You always prepare for the worst. How do you prepare for the worst, guys? Multiple streams of income. Multiple streams of income, multiple streams of income, multiple streams of income. That's how you prepare. Median incomes 
have risen just 23% over the past four years, leaving many people out of the running for home ownership. In 2020, a household earning 59,000 a year could afford a typical home priced at about $240,000. So in 2020, pandemic, you could go buy a house for around 240K, under $60,000 a year household income. That was in 2020. At the time, that income level was less than the median income of 66,000. So in 2020, the median income across America was about $66,000 a year. As long as you made 59, you could afford a house around 240, right? Meaning more than half of American household had sufficient cash flow to purchase a home without overextending their budgets. So since the median household in America in 2020 was $66,000, but you only needed $59,000 to afford a house, roughly $240,000, you know, half of Americans could do that back then. Just four years ago, guys. This ain't four decades ago. This is four years ago. Let's keep reading. Today, these shopping, today those shopping for a home need to earn $106,000 annually to afford a median priced home of $343,000. <laughs> so it goes from $59,000 all the way up to $106,000. How many of y'all were making $59,000 in 2020? Now you make almost $106,000. How many of us made that jump? Especially not on our primary. Now, if you got you some side hustles and you, you, you know you started hustling, maybe. But most people ain't gonna get no side hustles and ain't gonna hustle. Most people are not gonna do that. So I don't know many people that went from making $59,000 to $106,000. W-2 folks. Not talking about you got your own business and you and exploded. I'm talking about W-2 folks. Not many of them, right? Not many of them. But that's where you would need to be today to own a home. A medium priced home, your income would need to be about $106,000 a year. Up from 59 just four years ago. Y'all tell me, I'm trying to tell you what's happening to, to, to these goods and services, man. What's happening to these home prices. What's happening to car prices. All that stuff has skyrocketed while your salary only went up about 23%. You got to understand that, guys. That's not good. That's not good. Let me just plug up my phone real quick here, guys, so that I don't lose my, lose my information here. So, yeah, that, that's alarming, right? But let's read on. Let's read on. That's $47,000 more than they needed to earn in 2020 to afford a home and well above today's income of 81,000, right? So today's median is about 81 according to them, but you still need 106 to afford just a $343,000 house, guys. And I don't know what part of the country you guys live in, but where I live here in Southwest Florida, that's not an expensive home. The median, the median price for a home in the state of Florida right now 500k so those of you who want to move to florida you better be bringing your your, your 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 brinks truck with you they ain't fooling around here in florida and i know other states like california uh uh new york are, are more expensive florida average house i'm not talking about a mac daddy house i'm not talking about some mansion i'm talking about a regular schmegler Half a million for a regular smegular house. Three bedroom, two bath, maybe 2,500 square feet. Half a million dollars in the state of Florida. So you know what you better become in the state of Florida with your income. 106 ain't gonna get it. You gotta be way higher than that to afford a house in the Florida. Now, there are some areas that they're building houses where I live 
that are less than half a million, but they're very small cookie cutter communities. No amenities, on, typically on busier streets, not really sidewalked, so ain't no getting out and walking nowhere, You'd be in the road, you ain't no sidewalks. So, so there are brand new houses that are coming up in certain areas, but, but they're not the ideal location. They don't have no amenities. So, yeah, I mean, it just depends on what you're looking for. But the, but the average house in Florida is 500K. So they're saying here, these findings from a new Zello analysis revealed how tough breaking into home ownership has become as the cost of purchasing a home has outpaced income growth. Did I just say that five seconds ago? Did I just say that? Everything that you gotta buy has went up in price higher than what your raises have been over the last four years. See, I keep telling y'all, we can sit here and act like this thing gonna get better. It's not. Y'all think these prices coming back down? They not, guys. That's the new precedent. See, that's the new price point. This is what happens. This is the new price point now. The only way you meet this new price point is you got to make more money. That's why I keep telling y'all, you're sitting around here and you're not trying to figure out how to have multiple streams of income. Uh, uh, you're hurting yourself. Oh, prices are going to come down. Right, They're coming down. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait on home prices to come down. <laughs> Boy, these home prices ain't coming down, guys. You, you ain't y'all ain't getting this. This is the new stand. This is the new price. This is the new price. It's not going down to 200. Here in Florida, you ain't going to get a new construction house for 240000 Not in Florida, you're not. not. Well, not where I live. Now, I don't know where you know, up in northern Florida, you know, in the rural areas, you know, you and your buddy build your house. You might can do it. But you ain't going to get no real. No, 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 no. It ain't happening. Not, no. Now, that 240000 stuff, guys, it, for, for most parts of the country, that's gone. Especially if you're in a neighborhood that, that's that low crime rate, growing population, has amenities, you know, close, you know, good schools, those type of communities, guys, you ain't gonna get no house for 240. Now, there are some parts of the country you can't, don't get me wrong, but in most parts of the country, no, you're just not gonna get it. So, so what do you gotta do? Price is not coming down, so what do you have to do? You got to make more income. That's all. You got to you you have to go ahead and get yourself in a position where you're ready to make more income, guys. I, I keep telling y'all, these prices ain't coming down. You keep waiting all you want. I'm gonna tell you what's gonna happen. Interest rates gonna come down, and guess what you think gonna happen to the housing market when them interest rates come down? Here goes some more demand for you. Guess what happens when that demand comes back, and you still got limited supply? Guess what's going to happen to them home prices again? <whistles> Through the roof. Just telling you. So you can sit around here and, and, and think something's going to save you. You're going to have to save you. You're going to need to make more income. I spoke with a really nice lady yesterday out of California. About my age. Her and her husband doing their thing trying to get the financial freedom, got a couple things going. They're thinking about getting rental properties. They're thinking about paper assets. They already got a business that's doing well. And we talked about in that meeting, her and I, we talked about how do you get to this pot of gold in the next five to 10 years? Here's what I recommend you do. And guess what? It all built itself around increasing income. Once you increase that income, you throw that income into assets that generate passive income on its own. And just do that for the next five to 10 years. You do that, you're good. You win. But see, everybody ain't going to discipline themselves. Everybody ain't going to be consistent. Everybody ain't going to want to be patient. Some of us just won't flat out do those three things. Not when it comes to our financial life. We may do them in other areas of our life. But we flat out refuse to do them when it comes to our finances. We just do
So if you want home ownership, you better get you some more income. If you want to be in a good, solid neighborhood that offers you low crime rate, that offers you good schools for your kids, that offers you amenities, that offers you what? Property appreciation so that that dead asset can grow in value over time. If you want that, you better increase your income because these houses ain't getting no cheaper, guys. And as soon as they reduce those interest rates, more demand is going to hit the housing market. And when that demand hits the housing market because those rates are low and people can buy now, price is going up, guys. I'm just telling you. In my opinion, price is going up, not down. So this whole notion of, oh, I'm going to just wait. They're coming down. No, they're not. Not anytime soon. Promise you that. They ain't coming down anytime soon. So here's the situation. A point of concern. Barely a handful of major metros evaluated were affordable at the median income. See, I keep telling y'all across the United States, guys, the median home price is going up. I don't care where you live, especially if it's a good neighborhood. The median price for a house, I don't care where you live in the United States, is going up, especially if it's a decent neighborhood where people have a desire to live. Now, if you want to buy some house in an area that's declining, right, in population, and, and, and the crime rate is increasing, the public school system is garbage, you might be able to get one in that neighborhood. But I don't know many people want to be in that neighborhood if they can choose. Now, if you're forced to live in that neighborhood, that's a different thing. But from a financial standpoint, if you can afford to do better and live in a better neighborhood, most people will live in a better neighborhood. No one just says, you know, so I'm, <laughs> I got plenty of money, but I'm just going to go ahead and live in this crime written neighborhood because, hey, hey, I'm going to save you a few nickels. Most people don't say that. Most people say, well, if I can afford it, I want to get my kids in a better school system. If I can afford it, I want to be able to live in a neighborhood where I can walk my dog and not get mugged. Most people think like that, logically. No one says, I want to get mugged, so I'm going to move in this crappy neighborhood because I just love getting mugged. I just love being able, not being able to go outside and walk my dog. Nobody says that, guys. So all I'm telling you is across the United States, the average home price is going up. And when rates drop, y'all already know, y'all already know. A point of concern, barely a handful of major metros evaluated were affordable at the median income. The real estate firm defines, they're talking about Zello, the real estate firm defines affordability as spending no more than 30% of your income after offering a 10% down payment. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. When you do the math, most people right now, they're spending between 40 and 50% of their take-home salary on their mortgage. When you include taxes, insurance, uh, principal, and interest, they're spending 40 to 50% of their salary, their take-home salary, on their housing. So what does that mean for the rest of your financial life? Not good. You got no money to save and invest. If you're spending 40 to 50% of your take home pay, think about it, guys. The average family in America right now, $75,000 a year, median income. Think about that 75 k when you strip away, when you, when you take out your, your tax deduct, when you take out the taxes, when you take out your benefits, let's just say you got 60K left. You do understand on a $350,000 mortgage, right? $350,000 mortgage at a 7.5% interest rate. Principal and interest is about $2,800 a month. When you tack on insurance and taxes, you, you, that's about $4,500 a month. Do the math. 
4,500 times 12. Your take home is 60, which is about five grand a month. That's your take home. Your mortgage payment, when you add in impounds or escrows, that's what, 50 grand a year? So you got like 10 grand left over. Transportation and everything else you got to pay for. Utilities, food. You got no money left. That's why people can't afford to buy the houses right now. Right? Can't afford it. How do you combat that? Multiple streams of income. See, I'm always go back to the multiple streams of income. How do you combat it? Multiple streams of income. Oh, I don't know. I'm, I'm devastated. I can't get out of this. Well, yeah, you can. Take whatever time you, you're not being a producer, all this consumer time you're spending watching TV, doing stupid stuff that don't make no money. Oh, yeah, because we all do it. Even I do it, guys. Even I watch TV sometimes. Yeah, even I do it. Even I go out on the patio and just chill and listen to music. That ain't productive time. So we all have time that are not, is not productive that we can turn into production. You got you to gotta develop multiple streams of income, guys. It's the only way you, 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 you're going to survive in this new financial economy that we're in. It's not the same economy from 2020, guys. I just read you what, what's happening in the housing market. These people are saying you need 80% more in income today than you did in 2020. It's a whole different economy. It's different. This economy that we're in now requires you have multiple streams of income. One income, one primary income ain't gonna get it. It's not gonna get it. This lady I talked with yesterday, she was saying, you know, here's the thing. We built this business, but I don't really want to do all that work. And I said, listen, it's a, it's, this is what it's about. It's about sacrificing something today so that I can have everything I want tomorrow. My recommendation is if you got this business over here that's duplicatable, if it's duplicatable, duplicate it. Okay, I'm going to sacrifice working for another five years. But guess what? At 60, for the next 30 years, I get to do nothing but just enjoy my life and have my income take care of me. See, I'll take that deal. I'll put in an additional five years to duplicate my business and then I sell that business and there's my pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Why? Because it's a business that people will buy because it has an income stream associated with it. And guess what? Here's the key for businesses, guys. Here's where businesses are really, really good at building wealth. When you can have a business that don't need you to produce money. And this lady has a business that don't need her to produce money. That's a business people will buy because guess what? It don't need you. Anytime somebody's looking at buying a business and the business is all wrapped around you, don't nobody want to buy that because guess what? When you leave the business, it crumbles. Nobody will buy that business from you. Find you a business that you can create revenue and net profit that don't require you. Then you can sell that business to somebody. You can sell the income stream to them. But nobody wants your business is once you out of the business, there ain't no business. See, in that type of business, what you should be doing is not worrying about selling the business. What you should be worrying about is maximizing the profit from that business taking that profit and putting it in something that don't need you to create income. That's what you should be doing. Those of you working in your business, you should be maximizing that thing where it's profitable. And then you take that profit every single year and put it in something that don't require you. That's what I try to keep telling y'all guys. You, you got to take this active income and turn it into passive income. That's what you do, guys. Get these side hustles. Make this thousand, two thousand, three thousand, four thousand, five thousand dollars a month and put it in something that will grow and produce income without you. That's how you live and survive and thrive in this new financial economy that we live in.
if you ever want to get yourself up here in this boom economy, you need income. You need assets. Or you're going to be forced to live down here for the rest of your life in this bust economy. I don't care how well the economy is doing. You will never participate in it because you don't have no assets. You're going to be living around an economy that's killing it, but you're suffering. Why? Because you don't have no multiple streams of income and you don't have no assets. You cannot participate up here in this big boy economy unless you have those two things, guys. No one is going to give them to you. You're going to have to go out and earn them. You cannot participate in the big boy economy. You're going to participate down here in this little economy that's struggling. You need 80% more money to buy a house. That's the economy you're going to live in. Unless you figure out a way to add more income streams and then take that income and put it in assets that don't need you to produce income. That's the key. That's the key, guys. That's the key. That is the key. Let's move on. Let's move on. I just wanted to give y'all that little bit on the housing market because I know a lot of y'all, oh, I'm waiting on interest rates to drop. That ain't going to save you. Mm -mm. That's going to hurt you. <laughs> the interest rates going to hurt you when they drop because that's going to bring in a whole nother flood of demand on this few little bit of inventory we got. And that's going to drop up prices. So guess what? Guess who gets to participate? People who have multiple streams of income and people who have assets and people who have taken care of their credit and got down payment money. Guess what? No down payment money if you don't got multiple streams of income because your primary income, you're not going to be able to afford the house. For most of us, most of us don't make $100,000 a year. Let's just be honest. Most Americans don't make $100,000 a year. The average income in America for a family is 75K, guys. There ain't nobody out there that make that but the upper income earners in the 1%. Just telling you, even at 100K, you can't afford a house. These people telling you to afford a $350,000 house, you got to be making, your family got to be making like 106. God forbid you're trying to get a $500,000 house in a better neighborhood with better schools, low crime rate, a lot of amenities. You need more than $100,000, man. You, 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 you need to be like 150, 175 family income to get a half million dollar house. I'm just telling you. So, so my point is multiple streams of income and then what you do with that income from those multiple streams will determine if you get to get up here in this Boom economy and this big boy economy. But you need multiple streams of income and then you need to take that income and turn it into what? Assets that do what? Generate income without you. That's the goal. The goal is I want to have all of my assets that generate income without me doing one thing. That's where the freedom is. That's where you get up in this big boy economy. Let's talk a little bit about stocks. And then we're going to wrap this thing up. A little quick thing on stocks, a little quick thing on crypto, and then we're going to get out of here. Here's the thing, what I've been telling you guys about stocks. And I've been telling you this for, for years. I've been telling you guys this for years. And I'm going to keep telling you for years to come. Lord's will, I'm here and I'm able to. The stock market, guys, is one of the big three. That's where people do what? They create their wealth and they hold their wealth in the stock market. That's one of the big three. They create their wealth there, and guess what then they do? They hold it there for income, right? Now, here's the thing. A lot of people do not invest in the stock market. I don't get it, but okay. I get, okay, you don't, you don't. But for those of you who, 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 who want to find a way to be able to start building assets immediately, paper assets might be an option for you. Here's what's happened in the first quarter of 2024. Had you been invested? Had you been taking that $1,000 a month like I've asked you guys to do? Have you been doing that? Here's, where, here, here, here's the type of return you would have gotten in the first quarter. We already know what 23 was. Monster. Monster. But here's what it's done in the first quarter. 
S&P 500, here, here's the headline. S&P 500 closes at a fresh record post strongest first quarter performance since 2019. Now, who in the chat has copied my plan? SPLG tracks the S&P 500. I've been talking about that for three months. Been telling you guys the wealth transfer blueprint. I'm taking X amount of dollars. I'm taking 50% of my money that I invest in paper assets and it's going into that broad-based stock market ETF. Haven't I been saying that for the last three months? Every video, every day. Haven't I been saying that? Yep, I sure have. So if you had been listening and, and you would have taken my recommendation, you'd be killing it right now. But I know some of y'all didn't. But those that did take the recommendation, you're killing it right now, right? You're up. Check it out. The S&P 500 rose Thursday, registering its best first quarter performance in five years. See what I've been telling y'all? Y'all listen to all this propaganda, all this, all this and all that. Proof is in the pudding. The proof is in the pudding. Proof is in the pudding. The broad-based Market benchmark was up 0.11% to settle at $5,254.35. The Dow Jones Industrial Average added 47.29 points or 0.12% and finished at 39,807.37. Both indexes closed at record highs. Haven't I been telling you guys since January 1 of 24, even when we had that little dip, when the big boy billionaires were selling their stock and cashing out profits from 23, I was telling y'all in January, guys, get in the game. Put yourself in the game. Put yourself in the game. I told you that in January. Put yourself in the game. I don't care if it's $50 a month. I don't care if it's $100 a month. I don't care if it's $1,000 a month. Get in the game. Get in the game. Right? Y'all know I've been telling you that. Both indexes closed at record highs, and the S&P hit a fresh all-time high during the session. The NASDAQ composite slipped 0.2 to end at 16379.46. For the first quarter, the S&P 500 added 10.2% for its best first quarter gain in, since 2019. Guys, it did 20% last year in 23. It started off the first quarter of this year over 10%. Remember, I keep telling you, where do you get that 8% rate of return from? Where can you get that? Proof's in the pudding, man. I don't make this stuff up. I just live by it. I just execute on it. See, I don't need no, I don't need somebody to, uh, to give me a, 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 a history lesson on the stock market. All I need to know is Warren Buffett got his money there. Jeff Bezos got his money there. Robert Smith got his money there. I guarantee you Michael Jordan got some of his money there. All the big boys got their money there, guys. FYI, all the big boys got their money there. When all of them take their money out, that's when I'll take mine out. How about that? But until then, I'm going to do what they do. They're billionaires. If billionaires got their money in the stock market, why would I have mine there? I don't know. I just follow the financial breadcrumbs of the billionaires. The billionaires got their money in the stock market. If I want to be financially free, it might, it might behoove me to follow their lead. I'm just saying, y'all do what you want to do, but I'm just saying, 10% first quarter for the best first quarter since 2019, when it rallied 13.1%, the 30 stock Dow advanced 5.6% during the period for its strongest first quarter performance since 2021. When it jumped 7.4%, the NASDAQ ended the quarter with a 9.1% pop. 
I'm just telling you guys, just, just you know, listen. Paper assets is one of the greatest ways to, to build wealth. All I'm telling you is the proof is in the pudding. Don't, don't take my, go, go, go to the $1 trillion research lab and, 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 and research it for yourself. Just type in S&P 500 uh, rate of return over the last 90 years. Just type that in into the, into the $1 trillion research lab. Type that in and see what you get. I'm not going to even go into VGT. I'm not going to even go into FTEC, the one that I'm buying right now. I used to buy VGT, but I, I flip-flopped and went over to, I ain't going to even go into that. I ain't going to even go into that because that's a, that's a monster. I'm not going to even attempt to go into the Magnificent Seven. I don't even want to, because y'all already know what the numbers look like on the Magnificent Seven, especially with NVIDIA and what Microsoft doing and what Meta doing. Now you got Apple and, 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 and Google, AKA Alphabet, getting ready to partner up with some AI technology. Come on guys, listen man, if you want a way to build wealth long-term over these next 10 years, consider paper assets. Consider it, consider paper assets, man. Consider it, get in the game. Stop delaying. Stop. Oh, I got to learn everything. Oh, I don't know how to do this. Oh, I, what that mean? Oh, but, 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 but. go to the $1 trillion research. I told y'all this all the time. When there's something that you don't understand, just go to the $1 trillion research lab. Type it in the search bar. What does this mean? What does dollar cost average mean? Just type that in the $1 trillion research lab. It'll give you the def it'll tell you exactly what it means. See, we, we have the resources to find out anything we want in this world. We just don't use them. We just won't use the resources. So there's no excuse. Oh, I don't know what an ETF is. That's why I'm not going to invest. That's an excuse because you can easily find out what an ETF means. All you got to do is go to the $1 trillion research lab. What is an ETF? Boom, there you go. Plain and simple. It'll tell you exactly what it is. Oh, I don't know what the best ETFs in, 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 in the S&P is. Go to the one trillion dollar research lab. Give me the top five S&P 500 ETFs in 2024. Boom. There you go. That's all you got to do, guys. That's all you got to do. We got to stop making these excuses while we don't build wealth. Prepare for the worst. Expect the best. How do you prepare for the worst? Multiple streams of income assets. Period. Multiple streams of income, assets that generate income without you doing anything. That's how you prepare for the worst, right? Let's move on, give you a daily dose of crypto, and then we're going to sign out of here. So one of your big boy, one of your big boy blue chip Wall Street firms who've been buying Bitcoin like crazy started their own Bitcoin ETP is now saying not so good things about Bitcoin. Here's the headline. BlackRock says Bitcoin returns likely to come down now that it has been embraced by Wall Street. Remember yesterday we talked about how, how the old uh, crypt, crypto well, what the old crypto well looked like back in the day before the big boom you had different crypto wells. You had these anonymous, don't know who they are, individuals controlling all the crypto. But then that shifted this year. Now you got corporations controlling all the crypto. And y'all know what corporations do, man. <laughs> they all about that profit, right? I talked to y'all about micro strategy yesterday. They have over 9.1% billion dollars worth of crypto. Micro strategy. This is a company. This is a corporate company. So, so all of you guys, before you know it, BlackRock, Grayscale, ARK, Tesla, micro strategies, all these big boy blue chip Wall Street firms and companies, S&P 500 companies going to own all the Bitcoin. They're going to own it all. And just run the price. They, they, they will run it. What At some point, they dump it on you. But for right now, that's who controls it now. No longer do you have these anonymous Bitcoin wells. You don't. 
So let's read on. Let's see what BlackRock has to say. If you're looking for your Bitcoin to go to the moon, the window of opportunity may be slowing closely, according to BlackRock. Oh, let's read on. That does not mean it has hit its ceiling or that there will not be rallies. However, as the cryptocurrency becomes more mature and institutionalized. Now, isn't that one of the things y'all argued with this whole time? There's no one that controls it. There's no one having a monopoly over it. It's decentralized. No one. Guess what's happening? There's a monopoly coming. And guess who that monopoly is? Big corporate. Wall Street giants. They're going to monopolize this thing. And y'all know what happens when they do that. Y'all already know. I'm telling you, BlackRock is telling you what's coming. So if you got Bitcoin, they're telling you what's coming. BlackRock, $10 trillion under management, largest investment firm in the world. BlackRock, or at least in America. I don't know about the world, but they're the largest investment firm in America. BlackRock, they're telling you what's coming, right? Check it out. They're telling you what's coming. That does not mean it has hit its ceiling or that there will not be rallies. However, as the cryptocurrency becomes more mature and institutionalized with the advent of exchange traded funds, the days of its monster gains may become a thing of the past. According to Robert Mitch Nick, BlackRock's head of digital assets. See, that's the whole thing when they start with the big boys get it right, especially these big Wall Street firms. They're going to make that. They're going to chop that thing up and make it accessible for everybody. But guess what that does to the price? Some of y'all help me out. When something is more scarce. Does it hold value and go up in value faster when it's scarce scarcity or when there's abundance of it? When all I need is five bucks to buy me some, uh, what happens to it then? There you go. Bingo. That's what happens. Now, all I need is 10 bucks. I can get in the game. That don't make it more valuable, guys. That makes it less valuable, in my opinion. But let's read on. Let's read on. Let's read on. Certainly, returns going forward will come down. This is what BlackRock is saying, guys. This is BlackRock. $10 trillion under management. They have already started one Bitcoin ETF. Now they're working on some uh, uh, Ethereum Bitcoin ETFs. See, these guys don't play around, right? Check what he's saying. Certainly, re returns going forward will come down. He said at the Bitcoin Investor Day conference in New York City on Friday, it's not going to return 124% a year over the next decade like it has the prior decade. Come on, man. Y'all better help me out. So all of y'all think you're going to the moon and listen, you'll, you, you get on a rocket ship, you'll make a little money. But if BlackRock got anything to do with it, there ain't going to be no more of this 125, 150% returns anymore over a decade. This is what they're telling you, right? Listen to them because they're telling you because BlackRock ain't messing around. They own a lot of this stuff and going to continue buying it. They're going to make it mainstream. They're going to make it so dirt cheap to get involved in crypto and, and, and get coin and get Bitcoin. And they're going to make it so accessible to everybody that can breathe. And that's going to crush your little scarcity thing. It's going to crush your scarcity because you ain't got but 21 million of them. I, I'm just telling you. It's going to cry. Oh, they're going to keep having it, though. That's true. They're going to keep creating more. But but he also pointed out that Bitcoin notorious volatility has fallen steadily over time and may continue to do, given the effect Bitcoin ETFs have had on trading activity. This is a common view among investors. The idea is that by bringing more money and investors, particularly institutional types, with portfolio rebalancing strategies to the asset class, ETFs can enable more efficient price discovery as volumes increase. 
This topic is part of the education journey BlackRock is on with its clients, whose demand for Bitcoin exposure first spurred the firm's foray into the new asset class in 2021. That demand was massive and clear in 2023 when BlackRock filed to launch its iShares Bitcoin Trust. Mitchnick also said the firm is talking with clients about how Bitcoin fits into their portfolio construction. People need to be weary. We'll have bull markets, we'll have bear markets too, even in the post-institutional world, he said. And then what becomes interesting is how do you think about the direction of the volatility? So there you go, man. One of your big boy, blue chip, Wall Street juggernauts going to make this thing accessible to the world, to the everyday common folk. I ain't got to worry about no crazy crypto exchanges. You ain't got to worry about no crypto lenders. You ain't got to worry about all these shenanigans from these old pump and dump guys. Just go to BlackRock and get you one in your ETF and you're good to go. So a lot of y'all scammers, a lot of y'all pump and dump guys, I don't know what that's going to do for you. But BlackRock, they're trying to make this thing like very convenient. Open up ETFs. Everybody can participate. And guess what's going to happen, though, guys? The more the SEC allows these guys to open these ETFs, they're going to start regulating y'all. SEC going to start. Y'all already banned in China. Can't even buy crypto in China. They already banned in China. Can't even buy crypto in China. Banned. Banned. You got 19 countries. Banned it. What's going to happen in the U.S. since we, you know, we greedy, so we ain't going to ban it. Because we love money. We love exploiting the 99%. So we ain't going to ban it. But what's going to happen is, as these big boy institutions start buying up all of the crypto, all of the Bitcoin, companies like MicroStrategies, they own over $9 billion worth. Um, you got companies like Tesla. I think they almost have a half a billion dollars worth. I mean, it's like 10 companies that, pff, they got a bunch of it. As more of these companies get into this game, the SEC will regulate it, or at least here in the United States, it will. So that's going to cut down on a lot of this. Oh, I want it decentralized. It's not going to be de decentralized forever. It's going to be centralized. Why? Because the institutions are going to own it all eventually. Companies like BlackRock, Grayscale, ARK, and then, and then, and then, and then public companies like MicroStrategy, Tesla, all these other big boy companies, they're going to own all the crypto. They're going to own all the crypto. And then if you want it, you're going to buy it from them. Because there ain't going to be no other whales out there. At some point, these, these old whales, they're going to disappear. They're going to cash out. And these guys are going to be over here to buy it all. The next dump, they're really going to buy a lot. So be careful out there if you're, if you're buying crypto. I, I would say if you're going to buy it, probably the best place to go is somewhere like BlackRock through the ETF. At least you know you got a $10 trillion company on the hook for it, as opposed to some bozo over here who just telling you lies. And listen, go, go to BlackRock, check them out. They're a $10 trillion company. They got $10 trillion on the assets. Biggest investment firm, at least in the United States. I don't know about the world, but definitely in the United States. And I think right behind them is, is, is Vanguard with about seven and a half to eight trillion under management. So go check them out. If you, if, if you want to get access to Bitcoin, check BlackRock out. I don't support that or anything like that. I'm just telling you, when you got $10 trillion on the management and you're based in the United States, or at least part of your business is, there's eyeballs on you. They're not finna do anything shifty. Whereas if you go over here to some anonymous, you never can't see the guy, you don't know who they are, oh, you see some numbers across the screen, I wouldn't trust that person. I probably would. Not with my money. So there we go, guys. I've given you what, what, what I was going to give you today. I, 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 we talked about the recession. We talked about the housing market. We talked about stocks. We talked about crypto. Um, the last thing I want to leave you with before we get out of here is it's all about multiple streams of income. If you're going to survive this thing, 
if you're going to flourish, if you're going to get to financial freedom, it's all about multiple streams of income. It's about assets. It's about taking your active income and turn it into passive income through assets. So you ain't got to work for the rest of your life. It's about sacrificing something in the beginning. In the front end, you need to sacrifice something financially in order to have everything you, you want on the back end, right? You got to sacrifice something to get something on the back end. You got to give up TV. You got to give up gaming. If it ain't anything you're doing right now that's not producing income, you need to give up for a period of time so you can find some activities that do create income. See, you need to give up some of this crap that you're doing that do not generate income. If it don't generate income, give it up. Find things that generate income that you can then invest that income in these assets. Paper assets, real estate for income, businesses. Those are your three things. I recommend you take that money and put it in. What's the key for a business? I want to be able to operate a business that's profitable I want to take those profits and I want to put them into something that don't require me to be there and still generate money. That's what I want to do with my business. Or I want to develop a business from the giddy up that don't require me to be there. There are businesses that, that don't require you to be there and they generate plenty of money. Those businesses you can sell. You can sell that, that, that cash flow stream. Like I said, I talked to a lady yesterday that has a business like that, that I recommend duplicate that thing two more times and then package it up and sell it in five years and get on your big boat and, and, and sell on into the, the wild blue yonder. That's what I would do. You know what I'm saying? And in the meantime, in between time, while I'm duplicating that business, I'm investing in paper assets, hitting it hard every month. One, two, three, four, five thousand dollars a month. While I'm business, do building this business simultaneously, right? Tell you, man, this thing is not that hard, guys. We just have to discipline ourselves, be committed, be consistent, and be patient. It's not that hard. It's not that hard. We make it hard, but it's not. Building wealth is not that hard if we can have those three behaviors. It's not that hard. Well, guys, I appreciate you stopping by the channel. If you want those 15, up to 15 free stocks, if you want up to 15 free stocks, Moomoo is going to give you up to 15 free stocks when you open a new Moomoo brokerage account. When you put $100 in that brokerage account, they're going to give you five free stocks. When you put $1,000 in your brokerage account, they're going to give you 15 free stocks. Once again, you got to get in the game. There's a link down in the description box for Moomoo. That's how you get in the game, guys. If anything I said today, that's how you get in the game. You get in the game by having a brokerage account. And then you take this money from these side hustles and you pour it into assets. And you do that over a long enough period of time, you build wealth. It's that simple. And like I said, you open that Moomoo account, you send me an email, say, Richard, I'm rocking with you. I open my Moomoo account. I funded it. Send me those two videos. Then I'm going to send you those two big boy blue chip videos. I call them big boy blue chip because they are. They'll change your life. If you execute, they'll change your life, in my opinion. I'm not your financial advisor. I'm not a CFP. I'm not a CPA. I'm not a licensed, none of that. Didn't matter. I built my wealth anyways on my own, investing on my own. And ain't that smart. So if I can do it, you can do it. But you got to get in the game. You got to get down there in the description box and click on that moo moo link and get in the game. You got to get in the game. See, Michael Jordan would never be the greatest basketball player of all times if he did what his sophomore year of high school? Had he quit. You do know he got cut, right? You do know Michael Jordan got cut from the varsity basketball team in high school. Had he not put himself back in the game and kept working hard, he'd have never been MJ. He never would have matured in the MJ. Guy worth $3 billion today. Why? Because he didn't quit. He put himself in the game. Kept working. Now, he's a legend. And he worth $3 billion. Come on, guys. 
This thing ain't that hard. You just got to put yourself in the game. Guys, lock it in for a thumbs up before you get out of here. Appreciate y'all in the chat today. Uh, do me a favor. Hit that thumbs up for me if you appreciate the content, if you appreciate uh, this information that can help you build wealth, in my opinion. Again, it's just all my opinion. Take what you need. Throw back what you don't need. Go build you some wealth. Put yourself in the game. Lock it in with a thumbs up, guys, please, if you don't mind before you get out of here. That's my way of knowing the information that I'm sharing with you is information you appreciate. So lock it in with a thumbs up before you get out of here. One more time, put yourself in the game. Get down in that description box. Click on that Moomoo link. Open up that Moomoo account today. Go get that free stock. Go get that free money. Send me an email. Let me know you've opened the Moomoo account. Let me know you funded it. I'm going to send you those two videos. Wealth Transfer Blueprint outlines my three big boy blue chip assets that I'm buying, paper assets, and the Moomoo tutorial. I'm going to send you both of those. Collapse time frames for you. Boom. Hit the ground running. No looking back. Just hit the ground running. Don't even worry about it if you don't know that much. Just hit the ground running. We'll learn on the fly. We're going to learn as we go. And if you get stuck, send me an email. Richard, I'm stuck. And then you know I'm going to direct you the way you need to go to get you unstuck. That's my commitment to y'all. I get 150 emails a day. Within 24 hours, they all return because that's what I do. I'm not only just talking. I, I return emails. You ask anybody that sent me an email, I'm returning the email. I'm going to say something. Now, I ain't going to be in there trying to do no, you know, no dissertation in my response. I ain't got time for that. But what I do got time for is to say thank you very much for rocking with me. Oh, oh, this is where you need to go. Oh, oh, this is what I would do. Oh, man, you need to schedule a one-hour financial session with me so we can talk about this and unpack this thing. But we're we going to need an hour to do it. So, so that's what I do in the responses. If, if you got a question, go down to the description box. Send me a DM on Instagram. Richard Fane, Millionaire Mentor. That is down in the description box as well. And um, let's go get this money, man. Let's go build his wealth. Let's go get it. Let's go get this money. Let's go build this wealth. Thoughts become things. See it in your mind. You can hold it in your hands. You guys keep chasing your greatness. Never stop believing in yourself. Stay healthy. Get yourself wealthy. And I'll catch you on the next one. Peace.